what I do, or what, the way I think about what I do, is, is that I make paintings, and the paintings are always about painting and about what painting can do. And I think those have things to do with the, the moment when the moment when I came to painting, which is kind of at this post, like I suppose I started being seriously interested in painting in the early, late 90s, early noughties, when various things had happened. Postmodernism had happened, the 20th century had happened. Um, contemporary art was, begin, was sort of in this moment of first stages of its boom, particularly in Britain, you had the Tate Modern. And there was, and I kind of understood Paintings being this thing that kind of could exist across across time and across different um, there were lots of different bits within painting that I was interested in. So I was kind of interested in. I spent a lot of time when I was young going to museums, looking at all the paintings, going to Florence, Paris, and the thing I was always struck by was that I could be looking at something from the 1430s or from the 1970s, and they were these were just these silent, quiet things which were coming from completely different contexts, but they were somehow connected by a tradition. And there was something that they did which was, regardless of the form or the content, they were doing something which had a similar kind of charge. And so it didn't matter if it was in the Uffizi or in the Teemon, there was a there was a kind of a there was this, you know, a museum as a or a painting is normally a quiet thing, but it has this sort of vibration was charge and so the the thing i've always been interested in is kind of like what is it about this you know this this thing of paintings where you can name them you can say this is a tombi and this is this is a sort of pivotal moment of american abstraction or this is velasquez and it's a domestic scene from rural spain and this is this is that and this and that but it's the, the charge is not the content the charge is the thing and that's a very enigmatic thing that painting can be that is hard, it's very hard to grasp. And so I've always been drawn to the fact that in my own work, I can make, make a painting where on the first look, you can name the thing. It's a plant, it's a portrait, it's, a, um, it's an abstract painting, it's a collage. But the, as you begin to name something, it begins to collapse or the meaning begets, becomes less clear and hard to understand and throughout the time that I've been making work which is sort of seriously for 10 or 15 years but kind of in a fairly engaged way for about 20 years more 25 maybe since a teenager the you also have this thing of the internet which changes what images do it completely collapses the time of them so art and images used to be in museums or on shelves. They were in libraries. You had to travel and you had to look for something. And now images kind of come to us in a, in more of a sort of, in more of a kind of a flow. And so particularly recently in my work, I've been trying to kind of understand how, uh, how my engagement with painting as a historical practice, as a historical tradition can engage with not kind of not how uh, the digital era looks, but how it feels sort of in your head, what it's doing to us. And those things, I think, and they're kind of, this is, a sort of, is that it essentially it's to do with dislocation, that we're dislocated in terms of time and we're also dislocated in terms of place. So you might spend a summer being very, you might, you might spend a summer thinking a lot about an exhibition which is happening in New York, where that artist who is based in LA is making work about 17th century Holland. So all those three things, and all of that whilst I'm sitting in a studio in Berlin. So all of those different things can be happening. And those things used to be in the museum on, on the shelf, and they're now kind of in our lives all the time. And so these paintings that I make at the moment, there's a kind of, um, there's an obvious sort of slightly, um, kind of theatrical interaction with history and the way that they're presented, which goes against a kind of modernist tradition of making the painting more as available as possible. So they're back in frames and they're behind glass and there's this kind of theatrical distance to them. But I, 
actually have found that's a way it's a way of like by rejecting the kind of essentially a modernist trope of of removing the painting from the frame I've given myself more freedom because I know that they exist in this frame and this that theatricality means that I can play more with what's going on inside the painting themselves and that gives me this space to kind of play with play with time and play with the different kind of handlings and essentially to try and kind of engage all of the different all of the on some level all of the different painters that I want to be and this is one of the other things that's complicated in the journey of a painter is that you begin on some level you begin I mean we all be, we all draw as children and then maybe we engage quite seriously as a teenager and then a lot of people stop and then some of us just carry on and so on some level you're still painting but the the and my my understanding and knowledge of painting may be more sophisticated now than when I was 12, but my instinct for it was very similar. And so trying to connect to those different kind of impulses of the, the, the 12 year old that liked Van Gogh versus the 22 year old that liked Twombly to the 32 year old who was interested in the tradition of Greber or, you know, something kind of more recent. And, and so that, but all of those different positions are kind of valid and interesting and I'm trying to engage with them when I'm when I'm working and I'm also trying to engage with the fact that you you make a painting I mean I am making these paintings in my studio in Berlin in the early 2020s and so there's that's a sort of fixed location and historical location but these paintings are being shown in Palma they might be re-shown in 20 years time somewhere completely different and then they also some of the paintings feature um my children and so as an audience or as a subject they have their own completely different set of sense of time in that a painting that their father has made now will only really be able to kind of you know will be something they may still be processing in 20 or 30 or 50 years time and so painting itself as a discipline is constantly engaging with its history and the digital era is making that much more complicated and at the same time I have to try and so I'm trying to do those things whilst obviously making my paintings at a specific time during the spring of 2023 or wherever it might be. Um, and so those are the kind of um, those are the kind of considerations that I'm always working with and then and how that kind of what that produces at any one time that's the sort of current that tends to run through the work. The idea that technolo technology has something to do with the future doesn't really, actually what it does is it constantly brings up the past. And so what I feel or I kind of see around me in, in a lot of art production, or a lot of painting at the moment is that people are suddenly the, the 1920s might feel very, feel suddenly very prescient or it's, it's suddenly there because the digital has a way of just bringing things up from, from the deep where they suddenly seem very, very relevant. And so similarly to kind of um, the, 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 the portraits I did of the fat man from Robert Kempen painting that was shown here two and a half years ago, that was me connecting with some kind of contemporaneity of a painting from 1435, that something about that image looked very, felt very present or real. It had a sort of a timelessness, I guess. And and I think the this kind of the way things from different times, things from different places are rising and falling, that actually feels quite digital and feels quite current. So whilst some of the ways in which I treat the, the form uh, have a kind of anachronistic or a kind of borrow something from the past, it's, it's in order to try and understand something of the present. And that also relates to the, I mean, the title of this show, Manganese Blue, is, is a, it's a, it's a very vivid um, blue pigment, but it is specifically modern in that it only existed from the early 20th century. So as much as, as much as my paintings might relate in some ways to kind of an academic tradition of painting, even just some of the materials are necessarily modern. And, and so that is one way of kind of fixing it and saying this 
it's a sort of short circuit to the fact that this this history is is still from now, and also where I've used the, that colour specifically in these paintings, it's almost always to carve around the form. So it, the blue is not in the thing itself, it's not in the leaf or the face, it's the thing beside it, it's the negative space around it. So in the same way that we understand painting because of our experience in museums as children or because of how we studied it as young adults, whatever it might be, it's always that is the context around the way we understand stuff. So manganese blue is sort of, in my thinking, it's it's the thing around the things we know. It's the, it's everything that moves around it. So it may not be the work itself, but it's the it's the sort of how we got there. Um, something I do a lot, and something I'm the thing. One of the things that I'm most conscious and careful about controlling or, or, or just the thing that I find most productive in for me in finding a way to work and to make new work and to keep working is that I tend to work, I work again and again with the same things or the same motifs and so the most uh, obvious of those is the, is the rubber plant which I've been making paintings or versions of for a long time and similarly recently in these portrait paintings I'll keep coming back to, to a motif or an image and see if I can find something new in it, see if I can find a new... And so for as long as I have a new idea, then there's hope on some level. There's some kind of, oh, I think I've, I think there's, I think there's a path here and I think there's something that can happen. And so the, you will see the leaves. There's one in particular which keeps moving from painting to painting to painting. It becomes a kind of key. But the leaf is, also has a, very important formal property that a leaf is a it's a curve basically and a curve is a way to move the eye around the painting so I will play with the form I'll play with the placement I'll play with the composition so that the, these leaves will, will bring you through the painting and so they will take you from the top to the bottom or the side to side or whatever and then there'll be something there'll be another kind of leaf which is maybe more like a slash and that's more like in a fontana a way of kind of rupturing the surface a way of breaking things up but then there might be, then there's, then there's colour. And what do I do with that? And my paintings, that I'm very, uh, I've made a lot of very green paintings in my career, mostly, in my work. And so for about the last year or so, and particularly it's very present in this show, I've been trying a lot to use red. And so on some level, that, you know, this is something that painters do, is that you, you struggle with a particular colour for a long time. And so a lot of these things are kind of quite abstract or formal in their um, motivation or in my plan for making a painting. So it'll be, how can I work with curves moving you through the painting? How can I work with red as a, as a sort of dominant color within the, within the work? And because I've got the motifs, I've got the forms, I've got the portrait or the leaves or the, then, then I know I have something to work with and then I can play with these kind of more formal properties. So in many ways I've, I've approached the work in the same way that an abstract painter would approach it. It's just that I happen to use things that are nameable. So you sort of see face, leaf, but the paintings aren't really about face and leaf. Or if they are, then that might be a digression or a red herring. Or it might simply just be a way for me to start. And then there's the... But then with what the possibility of figuration offers, which is, I think, why I keep coming back to it um, and why, to some extent, I've never really made truly... Uh, I've, I've never really made truly abstract paintings, particularly recently, is because the, the other thing that painting can do is that it's a, it's a kind of an earthy material. You're playing with opaque, muddy stuff, but you can make it talk about light and you can make it talk... I mean, that's what the traditional oil painting is a lot of the time about. It's about how do you make mud talk about light, which is its ground talking about air. It's beautiful in its symbolism. And so in all of these paintings, there's some sense of light. There's the blue around the form. There's the light on the, um, as it catches features of the leaf or the face. And so this kind of way that a painting can have a kind of an inner glow that's also been a motivating thing. So these kind of three, four considerations were 
particularly the things that I was really kind of trying to hunt down in this group of works. And so you've kind of got line, you've got color, and you've got light. And so, and in the in the drawings, which I've which are new and I've not shown before, you can see me playing with the line and the form. And then in the most developed of the paintings, you see you see where the light and this kind of glow comes in. I don't really know because I never have a very good sense of what comes next. Um, but I do have always the same thing that I was saying before: that if I have, if there's something in, if there's something in the work that gives me hope or one more idea or some of a kind of a, oh well, there was this in that painting, and then maybe, maybe there'll be something else. And so sometimes a painting will then, you know, I will quite often I will on some level try and remake a painting or revisit a painting. And then that can produce a whole new body of work. That there's, there'll be some, there'll be some moment in a painting where, where I wasn't quite sure, and then, and it will take time, and it will sit there, and and then eventually I'll see the opportunity to to revisit that and to exploit a new thing. And so, for example, the first painting here when you come in was a plant painting that I started in 2016, and it had been in the studio for a long time. And it was there, and it was there in a completely different kind of a color scheme. The form was slightly different. And then slowly, sometime this spring, I kind of was trying to find a kind of a key to unlock this show. And I started looking, and it's, it's very small. And I started looking at that painting and saying, hang on, if I kind of work back into that, if I can, if I can find some new form in this painting, then maybe that will help unlock all of the others. And so the, essentially I just added, I mean, I made some kind of shifts in the composition, but I added one leaf and then started kind of a process of layering and glazing so the colours came more in tune with the rest of this body of work. And that is the kind of thing that, yeah, that painting had been on the shelf for seven years and I wasn't, it wasn't in my head at all. And similarly, I mean, the things in the work, the motifs, they come very rarely, but also very spontaneously. So the Barbara Villiers painting was a very spontaneous thing to say, well, I will take this old historical Barbara and I'm married to a contemporary Barbara and I will weave some kind of painting between these two things. But it was also, it's not particularly to do with Barbara Villiers and it's, it's sort of on some level it comes down to this, this kind of hand gesture of like there's, there's a sort of, there's something repeated that I can find in there to keep coming back to. And there's something between her look of kind of boredom and not quite sure that, that, that will make me kind of come back to that. I love the building, I love the context, I love coming to Mallorca. I love, um, I showed first time, I showed in the beautiful gallery upstairs in the Piano Noble. And so straight away when it was discussion for show number two, I was like, well, I've done that room, so I want to do this room. And next time I want to do that room again. And you can end up on a half Anything I want? No. I, I, hmm. I feel enough. Yeah. Thank you. You see? Professional. Talk all day.